Welcome, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, you're here for a couple of days in New York. Uh, let us know who you're going to go see. Um, well, in addition to, uh, to some of the folks here, we've taken the opportunity to get out and see a variety of investors, some in the private equity space, uh, some others uh, we're hosting uh, with the consulate a uh, roundtable with uh, some AI uh, companies that, uh, that are, some are active in, in Toronto, some are not. As a lot of the folks in the room here will know, Toronto has quite a strong uh, presence in that business and so, so trying to capitalize on that. But uh, lots of people to see in New York. Great. So uh, let's dive right in and have a look at the, the deficit projections. I've got a chart uh, for that. Um, they've been bouncing around quite a, quite a bit, uh, but last week you did say that you expected Ontario to beat the deficit uh, forecast you had for, for this year, which was $10.3 billion. Um, what kind of a beat are we looking at? Well, we'll have to wait. November uh, November sixth is our uh, our fall economic statement, and uh, as 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 those of you who watch uh, watch our economy closely would know, uh, we have uh, as a result of, of some of the changes I think that, that we've made since being elected uh, a year ago, June, seen uh, some very positive uh, turns. About uh, two hundred eighty thousand. Uh, new jobs and all that employment and activity has generated some additional revenue. Uh, we saw that in the uh, in the uh, last year's numbers, in the 2018 numbers. Uh, but um, but you know at the same time uh, we're looking at uh, at the areas uh, from a public service perspective, whether it's healthcare or education, uh, that require investment as well. So so we'll have that update on the sixth. But what I was able to say last week is that we're gonna we're gonna be able to beat that 10.3. And as uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, we have set a, a timeline of 2023 to balance the budget. Um, it was very politely put, but we are a significant uh, sub-sovereign lender. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $36 billion uh, that will be, be in the market for. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, that requires that we, we, we have a kind of transparency that I don't think we've had uh, as much, at least as much as we think we should have in the past. Right. So um, given that things are improving quicker than expected, do you think there's a possibility you could get to eliminate that shortfall ahead of that target as well, 2023-24? No, we're, we're really focused on, on, on a very prudent plan, and so, uh, so on that, that time horizon. Um, as uh, as uh, all of you know, uh, if, when, uh, from your backgrounds, when you're dealing with, with challenges from a money perspective, they, they need to be dealt with deliberately. Uh, but at the same time, we have you know, significant commitments around things like infrastructure, uh, significant commitments around uh, fixing elements of our healthcare system that need to be fixed, our education system. Those all take investments as well. So, uh, so it's a prudent plan, and, uh, and we're committed to that uh, 2023 timeline. Okay. So you mentioned the 270,000 jobs that have been created since uh, last June, June 2018. What are some of the other elements that are helping the economy uh, roll along uh, quite well at the moment? Listen, I think, I think there is an aspect of confidence uh, that comes out of some policy changes we've made. Uh, we've committed to getting rid of 25% of the regulation uh, by, by the end of next year. Uh, we have reduced the, the tax burden. Uh, on both individuals and on uh, on businesses to the to the, uh, the tune of tens of billions of dollars over the over the next uh, number of years, um, but obviously we're also beneficiaries of uh, of the strong economy uh, in the United States. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but if Ontario was a standalone country, it would be the third biggest trading partner. Uh, for, for the United States. We're the number one trading partner for 19 states and the number two trading partner for nine other states. So to the extent that we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of activity uh, coming out of, uh, out of the United States, that's obviously helpful. It's been helpful as well to see a lot of the tariff issues uh, that were, were previously challenges uh, resolved. Um, and uh, and you know we have some some specific drivers. Our, our housing market, certainly the agribusiness environment market, has been quite has been quite uh, quite strong lately. Um, I mentioned uh, AI and biotech. So there's some sectors that are particularly driving growth. But uh, you know we still we still are when you aggregate it together. Um, you know seeing that sub two percent. Uh, overall uh, economy that a lot of us are experiencing and, and we're having to manage the uh, the public purse in that way. I mean you, you you point to that I mean given that we've had this huge surge in jobs you're not getting as much bang for the buck as you you have in previous uh, years I imagine. Um, do you think that Ontario has in fact slipped down into a slower growth trajectory the same as Europe for example? Listen, there's no question that uh, ourselves and the other advanced economies are, are being affected by that uh, that growth trend. 
Um, obviously, we're trying to do the things we think we need to from a policy perspective, in particular providing certainty for, for, for investors and business investors so that uh, so they'll, they'll see Ontario as, as a place to, uh, to put, their, put their dollars. Um, but, um, but we are very much subject to, to a lot of those global trends, which is another reason why we're so focused on that path to balance. Um, I think that kind of prudence uh, right now, uh, we don't see a lot of it, uh, in my opinion, either, uh, either here uh, or, uh, or, or necessarily from, from at least uh, some other governments in terms of focusing on, on getting a handle on, on debt and deficit. But, but our belief is that that'll pay off in the long term um, in terms of providing stability and certainty. So that uh, so that investors will see uh, will see uh, you know progress on that and and uh, and of course uh, citizens of Ontario. I mean it's it's their debt and we have to treat it seriously. You did. Uh, Dave mentioned uh, in the intro GM reaching a tentative uh, deal with its auto workers. But that's not going to really change the fact that Oshawa is still going to be closed down in terms of assembly at the end of the year. Is there? What's your overall outlook for manufacturing in Ontario, which has been declining so much? Uh, as part of the economy, it, it has been a challenge uh, over the last number of years. Ontario lost 300,000 jobs from the manufacturing sector. At the same time, we saw some growth in other in other sectors. But you know, part of the investments we've made, uh, for instance, the accelerated capital cost depreciation that was part of our last budget, seemed to be bearing fruit in terms of, of investments in uh, in in, uh, in plant and equipment. Uh, so you know we're we're conscious that we are, as I said, a trading partner with many U.S. states, but many of the states uh, that that uh, people choose, uh, you know, when they're looking at an Ohio or a Michigan or a number of the border states, um, they're all strong competitors in terms of uh, of, uh, of investment in things like auto, um, and it's an it's an important uh, important foundation of our economy. So so. I think we're doing the right things uh, in terms of, of making sure that the environment is there for investment. Um, we are still, uh, as far as I know, uh, the only sub-sovereign jurisdictions that has still five of the large car manufacturers represented there in terms of, in addition to all the parts manufacturers, and that's a real, a real asset we continue to build on. Okay. So let's talk to the cost side of the equation in the, in the budget balance uh, scenario. Um, how do you feel that things are going along in reining in some of those costs? You know, one of the things that our government did out of the gate was a line-by-line -line review of all of the expenses uh, that uh, that uh, that the government had. We got Ernst and Young to come in and uh, and and have a look, and it pointed to uh, a number of opportunities. Uh, it pointed to some very big opportunities in the space of procurement. Um, it pointed to some very significant opportunities in terms of some of our major. Um, systems. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do we, you know, effectively manage the continued growth? Because we are continuing to invest in our healthcare system. But when when you have uh, a healthcare system that is 64 billion dollars of uh, of a 160 billion dollar budget, um, that's obviously a very important component that you need to make sure that you're you're maximizing um, the effectiveness of both from a healthcare perspective and a cost perspective. Uh, when we uh, you know when we looked across the way that infrastructure investments have been being made, what we found was that quite consistently um, commitments were being made but that not followed through on. And that was having the dual effect of being inefficient because we were in some cases borrowing uh, for uh, for builds that weren't happening or weren't happening until later, but we were also uh, not being as effective partners, you know, and we have quite an effective partnership model, uh, the 3P model that, that involves the uh, an important role for the private sector, but, but when you're not delivering on a timely basis on your commitments, then you start to make that market work less efficiently. So, so we've uh, we found a number of those features, and then, you know, right down to, uh, you know, as uh, famously, uh, you know, getting rid of, uh, of the landlines uh, in, uh, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of our offices that were literally costing thousands and thousands of Dollars, and I don't know how many of you have employed a millennial lately, but normally you have to explain to them what that what that's for, that thing on the that's desk. Right. <laughs> uh, so um, so uh, so anyway, some some also smaller things and some bigger things, um, and what you're going to see. And and uh, Doug Ford, our premier, comes from um, an industry in the printing business in an area where continuous improvement was an expectation, where lean approaches were an expectation, and that's really what we're trying to institute um, inside government. Not easy, lots of work to do, uh, but we believe there's still some efficiencies to gain and that lets us reinvest in the, in the critical service areas and get that deficit and eventually that debt under control. But the, the big ticket item is always labor, right? You did manage to uh, keep the educational workers to 1% raises, uh, but you've got negoti negotiations with the teachers coming up, which seem to me might be a little harder. They've already said they want to, some of those uh, class sizes uh, increased again and they want a cost of living increase. What's your message to them? 
Well, you know, I, we have a we have an excellent education minister in uh, in Stephen Lecce, who uh, who I think has has made the point, uh, and I'll just reinforce it that you know our focus is on making sure uh, that that the children in our education system and and their parents. Um, are getting are getting what we need in terms of a quality education, uh, and uh, and uh, Minister Lecce is you know, very involved in terms of making sure that uh, that as we negotiate with our labor partners, and you're right, we did uh, you know quite successfully negotiate with 55,000 education workers uh, from CUPE, and there's there's more uh, negotiations underway, but uh, but that message is still the same, which is that you know we're going to focus on what's what's best for the kids and and keeping them in class. Um, and making sure that we're getting the kind of quality education that we, we need for a modern economy. Uh, as all of you know, uh, who, uh, who follow what happens in Canada, and particularly in Ontario, one of our great advantages is, is uh, the people that we can provide, the human resources we can provide. And, and our education system is an underpinning of that, uh, as well our, our, our post-secondary education system. So, so there are areas that we need to invest in, um, and obviously we need good partners in our teachers, and, and I'm confident in Minister Lecce. So... You expect to keep to the one percent uh, cap that you're going to that no, you I, have in place? I won't. Uh, we won't negotiate on Bloomberg, so no. we'll let them. Uh, we'll let the we'll let the negotiations happen where they should. But um, but you know we do absolutely understand that uh, you know that one of the advantages that we have, uh, and, and I'm here in New York as I mentioned, you know, talking to a number of people who invest already in Ontario, some who want to. The consistent feedback we get is that the quality of the people that they can hire, whether they're coming out of uh, you know coming out of high school, coming out of post secondary, coming out of our training programs. That's one of Ontario's competitive advantages. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're gonna to keep investing in that, and, uh, and we'll have uh, good partners in the education sector to do that. So one area where you're probably not getting as much, as much uh, revenue as you expected is from the cannabis industry, given the slow rollout of stores. Mm -hmm. um, why not just scrap the lottery system and, and let the market dictate where, um, where the stores should be and how many there should be? Well, you know that that is that's actually the decision that uh, that we made, which was different than the previous government. The previous government had made the decision to have a, uh, a government-run, um, government-operated distribution system for cannabis. Uh, we made a different choice, which was to have a, a private sector-driven model. Uh, there were significant supply issues initially, uh, which I think have uh, now been largely resolved. Uh, but initially, the ability to make sure we could supply those stores was a priority. We obviously, particularly because we want to be a place that is sympathetic uh, to private business, we didn't want people opening up stores that couldn't be supplied. Uh, that, that situation has worked its way through. Uh, in the meantime, we've, uh, we've uh, used a lottery system, and, and, but we're, gonna, we're moving what, as quickly as we can. Uh, to uh, what we'll call an open allocation system, which mm -hmm. will be an open, uh, more open market. Um, the Ontario Cannabis Store is the process now of actually consulting uh, with a number of the producers in terms of how to most efficiently do that. Um, so you know, we, are, we are very focused on, obviously, uh, safety in terms of, of how distribution and the availability of cannabis uh, is, uh, is rolled out in Ontario. We are very focused on combating the illegal market, and we believe that in the medium term, this is the right strategy to do that. Um, but we will, uh, you know, we're going to be, be purposeful about making sure we roll out that distribution, mm -hmm. make sure that we can supply those stores, and, uh, and we'll be, you know, have more to say about that as, as it unfolds. So uh, let's just quickly turn to the borrowing situation. Uh, I think we have a chart for that as well. Uh, you've borrowed about 20.4 billion out of a projected 36 billion, uh, mostly Canadian dollar, uh, US, and a little sliver of Aussie dollars. Uh, do you think there will be a, a euro bond in your future? You know, we're, we're, we're committed to making sure that we have a, a balanced portfolio in terms of uh, where and how. Uh, we, we are, I think, targeting around 70% uh, domestic and 30% and uh, coming from foreign sources. Obviously, most of those foreign sources are going to remain U.S. dollars, but I think, um, I think it makes sense uh, to look at diversifying the base of that debt. If you go back to 2007, 2008, uh, there had been a, a bit of a purposeful constriction of that, so it was more focused on Canadian um, only and uh, and we just think uh, you know the, the markets are quite open to us. Uh, we're borrowing at uh, at uh, at very effective rates. Uh, this year we're going to borrow uh, roughly one percentage lower than than expected. And again, that's not a thing we have 
to do with in particular, but it, mm -hmm. but it is it is to the to the benefit of uh, of the public accounts. So so we'll keep that diversified base, and uh, and if that looks at other currencies as well, then we'll look at other currencies. What about extending the terms? It's so uh, cost efficient to be going to 50, maybe 100 year. How about that? Uh, well, Central those, bond I'll, for Ontario. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, I'll leave that for our folks who who deal with the market. But we're you know listen. The the availability of longer money is something we've been taking advantage of. Um, to uh, and as the spreads narrowed, um, you know it's 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 just made sense. Um, and as I mentioned, we do we do have a considerable amount of refinancing plus. You know, we have just in the area of transportation a $90 billion infrastructure spend uh, over the next 10 years, um, another $17 billion in healthcare, another $13 billion in education, all in terms of revitalizing that vital infrastructure. So, so uh, as, some, as people who are going to be in, in these markets for the long term, we want to take advantage of, uh, of what makes sense. Okay. So we've got a few more minutes left, but um, my two more questions. Um, Obviously, got the election next week. Who would you work better with in the next, uh, with, with the next after after next week? After who would you choose week. to work with if you could? Well, listen, I, I, uh, we, we will always work with whoever is uh, is focused on on good things uh, and uh, and and the things that need to be done in the in the province of Ontario. Um, it's uh, interesting. I'm I'm. Uh, Quite familiar with the current finance minister, just because we used to work together. Uh, he uh, he was uh, the the Chappelle part of Morneau Chappelle was a was a company that I was um, an owner and and the CEO of. So so there's a there's a relationship there, but but we'll build a good relationship with whomever uh, is in government. Um, we had some good news today, just as I was coming in, where we had you know Mayor Tory at the municipal level, a very important partner, talking about enthusiasm for the transportation plan uh, that we've uh, we've put forward in the uh, in Toronto in the greater Toronto area that's good news I think I think people really do expect that uh, that we as a government will work with you know whoever is there and uh, and I guess we'll find out uh, I, I listened with interest to mr. Nanos's comments um, earlier but uh, but I think we'll, we'll listen with interest to, to who's going to be the government this time next week okay and so uh, the question for everyone we've been asking is what are the chances of, of a recession in Canada in the next 12 months? Yes, and, the, and the only person who's absolutely not to use that word is, is myself and my two <laughs> colleagues uh, from, uh, listen, we're, we're, we're very aware of where we are in the economic uh, cycle, um, but, um, but what, you know, what we have the accountability to do as a province is to make sure that uh, you know, that we're accounting for whatever, whatever situation. I mean, there is a lot going on in the world today. Um, there's uh, whether it's uh, it's coming out of uh, of, uh, of the United States and the issues with China, um, or whether it's Brexit. There's a, there's a lot of variables that we don't control. Um, we're focusing on the things that we we can control, making sure we have the skilled workforce, making sure we have the infrastructure investment, making sure our public finances are in in proper shape, that they are uh, able to withstand uh, some uncertainty if it comes, and uh, and we will uh, we will see. But I do have a funny story if we have if we have a minute. Okay. Uh, it's, oh, it's, it, it is interesting as uh, as uh, as uh, Minister of Finance, as you would expect. I'm reasonably new in the job. Uh, I think it was about three and a half months or so ago, and so you get the benefit of fabulous uh, briefings from some of the smartest people uh, in our country. I would say even in the world around around economics. And one of the things that that you hear as a reoccurring theme is that you need to be you know careful about what you say. Because you could be here on Bloomberg and say something, and, and and something could happen, and and so after three or four suggestions that I needed to be careful, I, I leaned over to my deputy who's uh, here today, Greg, and I and I said, Greg, what is it specifically that I know that someone else doesn't know? Because if, if you tell me what that is, then I'll be sure not to mention it. And uh, and Greg smiled and explained to me that it's not necessarily that you know that much more; it's just that it's important that other people think you do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to burst that bubble here on uh, on so, uh, Bloomberg today. So you're today. not giving me an odd scare, right? <laughs> <laughs> so no recession. We will, uh, we will, we'll be prepared, and our, our finances will be in the, the kind of shape they need to be, so that uh, you know that uh, Ontario can weather any situation.